What's up, everyone? Welcome to AP Statistics. In this video, we're going to talk about collecting data, but instead of focusing on the good, we're going to talk about the bad. What can go wrong when you collect data? So our goal really is to focus on potential problems that occur with sampling. So again, remember the idea is that we want to gain information about a population. A census is a great idea, but oftentimes pretty hard to do. So we take a sample and the ultimate goal is for that sample to be representative of the population. So let's recall a couple of things we talked about in the previous video. The goal of getting a sample statistic is to accurately, not precisely, reflect a population parameter. Let's make sure we understand those two definitions. A sample statistic. A statistic is a value that summarizes data from a sample, whereas a parameter is a value that summarizes data from an entire population. That's the goal, to find the population parameter. A census could get us that goal. When a census is very difficult, we need to select a sample statistic. And our goal is for that sample statistic, again, a value that comes from a sample, to be pretty close, pretty accurate to the population parameter. We'll talk more about that in one moment. But a well-selected sample will not produce a statistic that matches the parameter exactly. It will naturally be off a little bit. We call this idea sampling variability. Sampling variability is the natural occurring difference between a sample statistic and a population parameter. Some students have a hard time understanding this, so let me dive a little bit deeper into it with a couple examples. Let's say that we are looking for the true population parameter, the proportion of high school students that vape. That's the value we're looking for. Now let's just pretend for a second that the true proportion of all high school students that vape is 17%. Now that would require a census. That would require me asking every single high school kid in the country, in the world maybe even, if they vape, which is pretty impossible to do, but let's just say I could do it. Meaning that this value, 17% of high school students that vape, this comes from the population, making it officially a parameter. Again, it's a value that describes an entire population. Now let's just say that you decide to look at a small sample of 120 students. And of those 120 representative random students, you find out that 16% vape. Now because that 16% came from a sample, it's known as a statistic. But notice that it's not the exact same as the parameter. It's a little bit less. Does that mean you did something wrong? No. Does it mean your sample was bad? No. This is what we call sampling variability. Because you are only looking at a sample, not everybody, your statistic might not match up with the truth exactly. Maybe another student in Oklahoma gets a sample of 120 random students, different than yours, and he comes up with 19% that vape. Well, once again, that is a statistic. Why? Because it came from a sample. But notice that that 19% is also not 17%, nor is it not your, oh, pointing the wrong one there, nor is it not the 16% that you got. Did you do something wrong? Did that student in Oklahoma do something wrong? No. It's called sampling variability. It is natural occurring differences between samples and parameters. There's nothing you can do about it. Let's give one more example, this time using a different value. Let's just say that we knew that the true average weight of all cardinal birds in the entire world was 47.5 grams. Now, once again, Pretty hard for me to know that, but let's just pretend I knew it. So let's just pretend that I was somehow able to stop and measure every single cardinal in the entire universe, and I was able to weigh them, and I got an average of 47.5 grams. 
Well, because that value came from the population of every single cardinal, that number would be considered a parameter. But that's obviously pretty hard to get. So maybe you go out and you get a sample of 25 cardinals, chosen randomly, of course, and they well represent the sample. And you get a sample mean of 45.7 grams. Now, because that 45.7 grams came from your sample, it's known as a statistic. And again, notice that that 45.7 doesn't quite match the parameter exactly. It's pretty close, but not exact. Did you do something wrong? No. Is the perimeter value wrong? No. It's called sampling variability. 100% natural variation, natural differences between something that you get from a sample and what is true. Once again, maybe a student in Denmark goes and gets another sample of 25 cardinals and her particular sample has an average weight of 51.5 grams. That once again is a statistic. Why? Because it came from a sample. Is that statistic wrong? Did that girl in Denmark do something wrong because her answer is different than yours? Her answer is different than the truth? No, nobody did anything wrong. It's sampling variability, natural difference between sample statistics and population parameters. But here is the big but. If a sample statistic is way far off from the population parameter it, that you are attempting to measure, then the problem is a lot more than sampling variability. If we don't represent the truth from the population, we introduce bias. So let's go back and talk about that 17% of kids that vape. Once again, remember that was my value that I'm pretending to know from all high school students. I'm calling that a parameter. If I go and get a sample of 120 kids and I come back with 45% that vape, well, that number is way far off from the truth. It's not just a little bit off, maybe a little higher or a little lower, where I would say, hey, guess what? Samples vary. What are you gonna do? No, no, no. This is so far off that something must be wrong. My sample must be biased in some way. My sample must be favoring kids that vape. Maybe it wasn't a random sample. Maybe I'm a vapor and I asked all my vaping friends and no wonder such a high percentage came back that they vape. I don't know, but when you're that far off, there's got to be a reason why. Let's go back to our cardinal example as well. Remember, we pretended that the average weight of all cardinals in the entire world was 47.5 grams. Well, if I go and get a sample of 25 grams and my sample comes back with an average weight of 10.2 grams, well, now that's not just a little bit off. That's a lot bit off. I can't blame this difference based on, hey, everything varies. What are you going to do? No, that is clearly introducing bias. Something has to be wrong. Maybe, I don't know why, but maybe my sample consisted only of baby cardinals, little teeny tweety baby cardinals that were just born. Well, no wonder the average was so low. I only looked at baby cardinals. Did I do it on purpose? I don't know, maybe. But I obviously didn't represent the population, which is why my sample was so far off from the truth. So we understand that the statistics are not always gonna match parameters, but they should be pretty close. If they're close, you're doing a great job. If they're not close, you're introducing bias. So bias occurs when certain responses are systematically favored over others. For example, yes, I vape, no, I don't vape. If the yeses somehow are favored over the noes, 
something's going on here. Maybe you're in a very bad school district where just vaping is going crazy. And what's happening in that school district doesn't truly reflect the population. So in simple terms, bias is when you don't get an accurate response that best reflects the population. Sometimes it's your fault. You're a bad statistics student. Sometimes just you didn't plan for it, but it happened. What are you going to do? Now, there are two forms of bias. Selection bias and survey bias. I call it before and after. And after I explain, I'll think what you mean by what I mean by before and after. But selection bias, the bias here occurs in the way you select your sample. So this actually occurs before you have your sample. So before you even have that number to look at, you've already done something wrong meaning that your sampling method did not involve an aspect of chance or random selection of the individuals or objects. This can happen several different ways. But the idea is, I call this before, because you don't even have your number yet. You don't even have that value, the 17% or the 47.5 grams. It, so the problem is occurring before you even select your sample. And how you select your sample is not good. Where survey bias, in my terms, in my, my idea, happens after you have your sample. So the bias is not in the people that you selected or the birds that you selected. The bias is in your survey. This occurs e after even a perfect random sample is selected. So maybe you have the greatest, most perfect sample in the world but your survey is biased. The bias here occurs in the way you go about collecting your data from that sample. So selection bias means it's, it happens before. So before you even have your sample, your plan was wrong and your wrong plan created a bad sample. Where survey bias happens after you have your sample, but how you go about collecting the data from those people or from those objects is bad. All right, so let's talk about selection bias first. There are four different types of selection bias. Volunteer response bias, convenience bias, under coverage bias, and simply not random. So volunteer bias is when a sample is comprised entirely of volunteers or people who have or people who choose to participate in the sample, and they're not going to represent the population. So here's the idea. I said in the previous video that you absolutely positively must, 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 must have randomness in terms of who gets picked and who doesn't. If you allow people to self-select or volunteer to be in your sample, that immediately creates a very bad sample. Why is that? Well, asking people to be a part of a sample and asking them to volunteer will typically attract people with really strong opinions. Asking people to be a part of a sample will also detract people who either don't care or have something to hide and don't want to be asked. Either way, the sample no longer accurately reflects the truth of the overall population. For example, if I said, hey guys, I'm going to do a survey on if you vape or not. Who wants to volunteer to answer my questions? Most likely the type of person that's going to say, oh, no problem. I'll help you answer that is somebody who doesn't vape. If you do vape, you're probably going to be like, oh, I don't want to be a part of that survey. I don't want to admit that I vape. What the heck would I ask? Why would I volunteer my opinion or volunteer my, my idea that I vape? That's volunteer response bias, okay? Um, obviously, anytime you have something that is politically charged, if you're going to ask a political question, once again, if you allow for volunteers, you're going to get the extreme sides, which don't produce very good results. So how do you fix this? Very simple. Don't ever use volunteers to compromise your survey. Convenience sample is another form of selection bias. This is where, honestly, it's just not random. You do something that's convenient because it's simply quick and ease of the researcher to do it. So I kind of said that poorly, but a convenient sample is where your sample is selected quickly and easily.
because you just want to get it over with. It's not random. For example, if I want to ask about vaping, I'd say, hey, you know what? I'm just going to use the students in my classroom right now. I got 20 kids in the classroom right now. I'm just going to use them. I don't, I, you know, I don't feel like doing it random. I don't feel like wasting the time to pick kids and, and get a random number generator and to pick 20 random kids. So I'm just going to use the kids in front of me. Well, guess who's in front of me? 20 kids in AP stats. AP stats means they're probably pretty smart kids. I guarantee most of them or all of them don't vape. So again, that's not random. I'm just doing that because it's simple for me. Or maybe I want a good sample of adults. I just go to the grocery store one day because I'm just looking for people. Well, again, that's not random. I'm doing that to be convenience. I'll be honest, maybe it leads to a sample that's good, but chances are it's not. So we don't ever recommend being, doing a convenience sample. Remember, number one rule, samples have to be selected randomly. This could definitely lead to bias. So how do you fix this? Don't ever use a sample that's selected out of convenience. Under coverage bias, it's actually also considered over coverage bias. This is when a part of the population has a reduced chance or no chance of being included in a sample. The sample will typically not represent the population. The most famous example that almost every AP stats book uses for this almost doesn't make sense anymore, but in the old days it did. And this was a um, example where to choose people to ask survey questions to, they used telephone numbers. Uh, everybody had a telephone number and they randomly picked telephone numbers. They called those people and they asked them some survey questions. How is that under coverage? Because if you don't have a telephone number in the telephone book, you never had a chance to be picked. So it wasn't that you had a slim chance, you had a zero chance. That's not fair, okay? And the example that I'm talking about is way back in the old days, like I can't remember, it was the 40s or 50s, when who had telephones back then? Only rich people. So when they, when they called people to ask the questions, they were really only contacting richer people. And obviously the opinions of rich people is not gonna reflect the overall population that includes all different socioeconomic backgrounds. So back then by using a phone, yeah, we didn't have to worry about cell phones back then, but the idea was that we were only actually getting to a certain group. So we were over covering rich people undercovering everybody else. So again, any type, anything that you do that completely forgets about a group of people, it gives a group of people no chance to be selected is undercovered bias, okay? Um, another silly example, and I don't wanna mean silly like dumb, but another example that might make sense to you is, you know, if I um, want to get people's feelings on how they feel about school lunch, but I only ask people that are in line for lunch. Even if I choose them randomly, I'm only asking people that are in line for lunch. And guess what? If you're in line for lunch, chances are you like the lunch because why else would you be in line for lunch? So I was over covering people who like the lunch and I was undercovering all those other people who don't buy lunch because they don't like it. So I never even, I never even got to those people to get their opinions on why, why they don't like lunch, right? school lunch. So how do you fix this? Honestly, you throw your data away and start all over again and find a way to not undercover or overcover people. All right, now let's talk about survey bias. Remember, survey bias happens after you have your sample. You might have the best, most random sample ever chosen in the history of statistics, but you do something wrong after that, okay, which occurs during your survey. All right, so we have two forms here, non-response bias and response bias. Most kids naturally think that they're opposites of each other, but they're actually not opposites at all. Very big difference between them. So please make sure you pay attention. Non-response bias, this is when individuals that are chosen for a sample for whom data cannot be obtained or people who refuse to respond. Now, the idea here is simply Johnny got picked to be in my survey, but Johnny doesn't answer my questions. He either refuses or I cannot reach him. So when some group of people that are in your sample do not respond, it's non-response bias. I mean, the name is very self-explanatory. But some people will say, well, who cares? Well, it matters because maybe the people who don't respond 
differ from those that do respond in an important way. And I probably would like to know what that reason is for why they're not responding. And that is why, simply put, I need to get their response. So again, imagine a perfectly random sample selected, but some of the people in the sample choose to not respond. The problem is that they were selected, so we need their response. The reason for their non-response could be the cause for why their data is different than the data that was obtained from those that did respond. If that difference is present in the sample, then guess what? That present is that um, difference is also present in the population. Hence, we need the data because we want our population to reflect, or excuse me, we want our sample to reflect the population. And if we allow people in our sample to not respond, well, then that means we're not getting everybody's true feelings or true data, and that is a problem. So how do you fix non-response bias? Honestly, don't throw everything away, but find a way to get those people to respond. The most common wrong answer I get is, oh, you know what? Just ask someone else. No, that is not the answer. You have to find a way to get the people to you that are, were chosen to give you an answer. Call them, visit their house, offer an incentive. It doesn't, I, somebody said, well, wait a minute, that's not, that's, that's cheating. No, no, as long as your incentive doesn't cause their answer to be different, that's not cheating. I'll be honest, a couple years ago, I got a thing in the mail asking me about what radio stations I listened to and what my feelings about them were. And in the envelope was a $5 bill. And it said, if I filled it out, they would send me 20 more dollars. The money wasn't going to change what radio stations I listened to, but it certainly made me fill it out. That was their way of getting my response. Maybe make it anonymous, especially if it's something about like vaping. Not every kid's going to want to admit if they vape or if they don't vape, they, they probably want to hide that. So listen, instead of saying, some people saying, well, I'm not answering that question. Then you say, okay, I'm going to make this anonymous. That way you're truthful with me and we truly get all the data that we were looking at. All right, response bias. Remember, it's not the opposite of non-response bias. Please don't think that. Response bias is any problem in the data collection process that would result in data being untruthful or incorrect. Now, imagine my cardinals, right? Remember I was weighing my cardinals. And I mentioned that my sample was 10.2 grams, which was way different than the truth. So clearly there was bias going on. What if my device, what if the weighing station, the scale I was using to weigh those cardinals was broken? So no wonder it's giving me all these low numbers. It was a broken scale. I didn't mean for it to happen. It wasn't the cardinal's fault. It was my fault. I had a device that was giving me responses that were wrong. Maybe it's a confusing or leading question. It's actually called wording bias. So maybe you're going to, you know, maybe you want to get people's feelings on a tax increase. And instead of just saying, how do you feel about the tax increase? Are you in favor of it or not in favor of it? You give a bunch of confusing or leading questions. Like, oh boy, this tax increase is really going to take money out of your pockets. It's going to, it's going to cause your children to not have money. It's going to cause you to, your savings account to deplete. It's going to, it's going to really affect your daily life. You're, you might have to get a second job because these taxes are so high. Are you in favor of the taxes? Okay. Well, I didn't need to give you all that leading and confusing stuff in the beginning. That's not fair. That's going to make you be like, oh my God, I didn't realize that this was going to happen to me because the tax increase, of course, I don't want the taxes. But that might not be how you originally truly, <laughs> truly felt. So again, if you word a question in a way that might cause somebody to lean their answer from not being the truth, that's considered wording bias. That means your response was a lie and that's obviously wrong. Um, Self-reported bias, this is when people are asked to give their own weight or their own height, okay? So um, some people might not be comfortable giving their, their weight or they might not feel that it's appropriate. 
So instead of you allowing them to potentially lie, you say, listen, this survey is going to be anonymous. Don't even have to put your name on it. All they would like to know is your weight. That might make somebody give a better response. Okay. Or um, another example I give a lot is, um, do you floss? Well, you know, I, I, I'll be honest, I'm supposed to floss every day, but I don't. So if you ask me, do I floss? I say, oh yeah, I floss every day, but I really don't. Okay. So again, these are examples where if you just ask people to give you a response that eh, they could lie about even height, a lot of shorter guys tend to not want to admit they're shorter and then they lie and say they're tall and they really are. And again, that could lead to bias. So how do you prevent that? You, you, you have this great sample in front of you and you say, listen, I'm going to bring you guys in one at a time. We're going to put you on a, on a, a measuring tape. We're going to measure your height and no one's going to know what it is. You're just trying to get the truth. That's what's most important is getting the truth and not worrying about anything else. Um, another example of response bias could potentially be the person asking the question could influence you. So again, if I want to do this survey on vaping and literally me, your teacher asks you, hey, do you vape? Hey, Carly, do you vape? Hey, Sally, do you vape? Uh, hey, Anthony, do you vape? Well, you're probably going to lie to me because I'm your teacher. And you don't want to tell me to my face that you vape. So you're going to lie. Well, that's response bias. Your response to my question was a lie because you didn't want to tell me to my face that you vape. So instead you lied. So again, how do I prevent that? Make it anonymous. Do something where I say, hey, just you're just going to write yes, you're going to write no, and you're going to put it on a piece of paper, you're going to fold it up, you're going to put it into a box in the front of the room, and I'll even leave the room. Again, you're trying to do something to get the truth. That way you have great data and not data that's biased. Lastly, it's important to know if there is bias, what direction will that bias lead you to? For example, how often do you floss a week? If the dentist asks me this question, of course I'm going to say, oh, I have seven days a week, every day. So if the dentist is asking the question, the true me or the sample mean, right, is going to be probably higher than what's true. So if you ask a group of people, how many times a day do you, how many times a week do you floss? There is a true number out there, right? But if the dentist asks that question, you're probably going to get a lot higher number. Um, what do you think of the president? If you use volunteers, the sample's probably going to be pretty negative because if you, well, if you want to ask people what they think about the president, you're going to get a lot of people are going to rush and talk about how much they hate him. And you're going to get a very negative response, very, very below. Now, I'm not saying that the, you know, what people think of the president is extremely high, but I'm just saying if you allow volunteers, you're probably going to get a very negative response. Have you ever smoked marijuana? If a teacher asks this question, the sample proportion is probably going to be a lot lower than the true population proportion. So let's just say the true proportion of kids that smoke marijuana is at 18%. Well, if I ask the question, I bet I'm only going to be probably around 0 or 1% of people that smoke marijuana because very few people are going to admit to me that they smoke. So again, the number is going to go way below what it really is. So we want to make sure that we understand if there is bias going on and what direction that bias could potentially be leading. All right, those are the things that can go wrong with collecting data, and we want to try to fix those issues so that they don't happen. All right, that's it. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the video.